Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all to the Asia SEF webinar. I request Evelyn, ma'am, to kindly start the session. Over to you, ma'am. Hello. Hi, everyone. I bring you greetings and best wishes from the Asian Oceanian Society of Radiology. And I'm Evelyn Ho, immediate past president of the AOSR. Thank you so much for the privilege of your time. And we hope you will benefit from points raised during the talks or discussion. Please send us your questions and even comments, regardless of whether it's positive or negative, based on your own experience on this theme of radiologists and radiographers or technologies, depending on which country you are in, uh, collaborating to promote radiological safety. I'm very happy to announce this is the first in a series of webinars held jointly with the International Society of Radiologists and Radiological Technologists. Today, Dr. Napapong Hong Napang, president of the ISRRT, and our new AOSR president, Dr. Noriyuki Tomiyama, are unable to join us. But mark your calendar for the 31st of March webinar, which will feature all of them. What is the importance of this theme? Just because we work in the same department does not mean that we are working effectively as a team. We may be working individually rather than looking out for each other and for the patient. We must share the same goals so that we can rely on each other and we are all as one team responsible when things go right or wrong. Team also means together everyone achieves more. We are in the business of providing a vital service in the care of patients worldwide. Our bottom line is always better patient care and outcomes. So how can we go about ensuring this? I quote from the joint document team working in clinical imaging from the Society and College of Radiographers and the Royal College of Radiologists in the UK. Research has shown that healthcare teams that function to get effectively together provide higher quality patient care. Members of teams that work well together have relatively low stress levels. A diverse range of professional groups working together is associated with higher levels of innovation in patient care. We, the radiologists, and radiographers are trained in radiation protection. We should lead the way by practicing and promoting radiological safety through developing work protocols and ensuring appropriate and justified use of ionizing radiation. We must develop a radiation protection culture. Therefore, AOSR thanks Asia Safe, ISRRT, and our speakers, Dr. Mr. Edward Chan and Dr. K. Yamada, to address this very important topic and all of you for attending. Just as a reminder, the feedback form will be available at the end of this session. Scan the QR code or click on the link provided in your chat box of the webinar platform. Once the feedback has been completed, our webinar provider, Vidocto, will be sending you a certificate of attendance, which some of you may be able to submit to your workplace for CPD or CME or your CME CPD accrediting body. With that, I shall hand over the session to our moderator, the chair of Asia Safe, Professor Kwan Hong Ng. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vinh Ho. Good afternoon, everybody. As mentioned, uh, my name is Kwan Hong Ng. I'm the current chair of the Asia Safe. Uh, I'm pleased that to moderate the first ever in this series of Asia Safe AOSR collaborating with ISRRT. It is a historical, significant event. Uh, first time the two professions are uh, officially collaborating, working together. Let me introduce the uh, first speaker, uh, Mr. Edward Chan. Uh, I've known him for a long time, uh, a personal friend of mine. He's a very senior radiographer from Hong Kong. Uh, he's with the Medical Imaging Department, Ministry of Hong Kong, uh, Shenzhen Hospital in Shenzhen, uh, in China. Uh, he is well qualified and certified in uh, various bodies. Uh, he is also the Vice President of the Hong Kong College of Radiographers and Radiation Therapies. Uh, also the ISRRT Public Relations Coordinator for Asia and Australia. Uh, that is a very important in public relations I'm sure he also will promote uh, radiation safety. So the, he will want to share with us the, the talk he's uh, talking to us on the role of radiographers in radiation safety and my experience in China. Over to you, Edward, please.
to show the video, right? Sarita will activate that. Yes, please. Hi, everyone. I am Ever Chen, the Vice President of Hong Kong College of Radiologists and Radiation Therapists. Thank you for the invitation from Asian Safe, um, so I can be the speaker of this webinar. My topics of this webinar is the role of radiologists in radiation protection and my experience in China. This is my uh, presentation outline. Okay, first of all, I want to talk about the duty of the radio first. So lay down the basic duty. Uh, radio first are using their expertise to help the patient taking medical imaging examination. So every day we have to contact with the patient and help them to do the examination. When we do the examination, we will, we are going to provide the have the diagnostic value medical image for the radiologist to report, and also for the clinician for them to manage our patient. During our practice, one of the very important duty for us is avoiding and also reducing the damage to our patient and minimize their discomfort of our patient during the examination. And all of this uh, damage or discomfort, including the radiation protection, or uh, even then, can, we can talk about it just like uh, radiation, uh, radiation safety. OK. How can we perform this task for our patient? Because during our education in the university, we have to learn that Radiation is uh, harmful to everyone. So we have to do it in a basic, very basic principle is the LARA, as low as reasonable achievable. How can we do this? How can we perform the LARA for our patient? So in our course, in our training, we have to learn the positioning for the patient, how to set the good exposure factor to minimize the radiation, radiation dose, and uh, even though the collimation and also can minimize the dose for the patient. And uh, including we have good positioning, positioning exposure factor and collimation, the very important is uh, immobilize the patient for the examination. That's so kind, all the other uh, technique we have to learn in our school. With this kind of technique, we also have a very, uh, have the good basic theory to understand why radiation is uh, affecting our patient and how the radiation affect our image. So we have to learn the radiation physics, just like we have to know that the, what is a photoelectric effect, compound effect, pair protection effect, even the photo nuclear interaction and the scatter radiation. Um, besides, we know all these kind of the physics. We have to use another extra technique to protect the patient or protect even the staff is the how to use the protective gear, uh, less shielding, or even how to uh, away from the radiation source is to be good for them. Okay, we know what the duty and uh, how we uh, uh, have acquired those kind of uh, technique to help the patient. So we talk about the role of the radiologist in the department in the medical imaging department. Have I mentioned before, we have to produce a good quality image. And on the other hand, we have to maintain the good condition of our uh, machine. This is uh, very important. If the condition of the machine is not good, uh, most of the time we cannot produce a good radio radiograph or even the medical image for reporting. And doing this, we have to, when we perform our duty, we have to minimize the repeating examination, this is our very important duty. So we have to take it accurate and precise for every patient. 
and doing the examination, we have to minimize unnecessary exposure. So that, that's why you have to know, have the knowledge of the, how to set the good exposure factor and even do the collimation. And, uh, and the, another duty we have to do, especially for the patient's uh, companion, is the how to teach, teach them how to uh, use the protective gear properly uh, and effectively. Okay, we're going to extend the role a little bit further. Uh, we not just like uh, well, all, most of the uh, some of the way of us not work, just work in the department. Uh, some of us are maybe take rotation. We're going to work in the other place uh, out of the department in the hospital. Just like uh, the first one, I have to point out this: uh, X-ray lovers are indispensable workforce in the hospital. Uh, according to the European Federation of Radio uh, Radio Society, and stated that radiologists are the key person in the radiation safety of the patient and the third person. That means. The reduces because our duty facing the patient every day and we have the cold contact with the patient and all most of the colleagues in the hospital. We are the very good position to help the safety, radiation safety for them. For example, some of us work in the ward, just like the best time radiography, and some of us will work in the operation theater. We do the uh, portable CM for the uh, surgery. So during that moment, we have the duty to protect everyone in the vicinity, how to, uh, how to help them to uh, have a good radiation safety. That's why we have to guide the other staff to use the protective gear properly and avoiding unnecessary radiation, that I, what I mentioned. And uh, sometimes we have to have chance, we have to teach the proper radio safety concept, especially the concept, not the working only. We have to teach them the concept and other professional in the hospital, how to them, how to uh, support them to do their duty with in under the very uh, safe conditions. The first extent our role from the hospital is going to community. So I can say that um, during the community, we have the greatest population in the community uh, compared with the radiologists and <laughs> medical physicists. So uh, radiologists supposed to have the, our knowledge of the radiation safety. So we uh, have the good position to educating the public. What about the radiation safety, when, especially in the healthcare setting? Just like, for example, we can communicate this with our relative, friends. Uh, if I have a chance, go to the public, give the public speech about the radiation safety in healthcare. We should show to them properly to help a public to understand it. Sometimes we also have to talk, uh, tell our public that we are shouldering the risk to serve a patient. This is some kind of, you say, the extra risk uh, for our patient. Uh, just like the other healthcare workers, um, they, we are the relief also facing the same risk as the uh, other healthcare worker. But we have one extra risk is the radiation. Okay, after talk about the general uh, idea about the role of the relievers, so I'm lucky to have chance to work in the China. So I want to share about what I'm. Uh, experience about the radiation protection or radiation safety policy and how to improve them in China. So from the picture, you can see that during our refer going to do the portable exam, most of the medical staff will find something to hide, to 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 stay away from the uh, radiation. So um, it's not actually this picture is not from China, from some one of the Asia country. So uh, but it's quite common and happen every day in everywhere in the hospital. Okay, what my first impression when I go into China to serve. So I find that the reservists are very different from what I am get used to. Uh, their behavior and attitude is very different. First of all, the reservists in China are not taking the radiation protection and patient care seriously. Why am I saying that? Just very simple say, 
Uh, when they go into the bedside examination, they ran so far away and do not observe the patient during the give the exposure. But uh, of course, then sometimes I think some of you may know that there's new technology coming up. Uh, nowadays, the uh, the bedside examine uh, the bedside X-ray machine uh, machine have the video cam, so we can monitor the patient. But this is not uh, another story. And uh, another, another point I want to have this comment is uh, they are so casual about the repeating the radiograph because of the convenience of the DR. I think this point is not just happened in China and I think it's many places happen in this way. Uh, because uh, nowadays the digital radiography or direct radiography is very um, easy to, uh, so easy to repeat. Just like, oh, the uh, image come out and then we have to do the repeat, just like we have the digital camera even from your mobile phone, that one. Uh, radio first, another point is that the relative did not understand the theory and the evidence of the radio safety well. Why I say that? Because a lot of my colleagues have this comment, say male or female are not willing to work in the new care medicine before marriage and pregnancy. If you say don't work in the pregnancy, I still understand a little bit this, what they worry about. Of course, that you don't have to worry about too much. But interestingly is that before marriage, they don't want to work because they say, oh, if I expose too much radiation, uh, no matter uh, how low the dose, it's no good uh, to, 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 uh, 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 to give birth a baby. Even the baby not forming yet, the fetus not forming yet. The second point, what I'm saying, uh, same face. The couples, when the couples preparing to have a baby, not pregnant yet, okay are not suitable work in the all radiation related jobs. They were this kind of concept and they told me in this way. So it made me very curious about is it really happen uh, that way or really they have this kind of concept and where the concept come from. So I did a, a small local survey for of my department staff. So uh, this survey is concerning about two parts. There's the radiation protection training, what kind of uh, training they have or what kind of concept they come from. And the other point is uh, what is the pattern or their work, their, their behavior during the best time with I will concern about uh, the hardware, how they use, and also the, uh, the practice before they come into my hospital and after my, uh, coming to my hospital. So this is a result of the survey. I just point out the important things, uh, important point for you to review. So uh, from the survey, we can see that 94% got the radiation protection course in the training school, and 86% believe they are uh, they their uh, radiation protection knowledge are evident based. Uh, majority that have uh, their radiation protection concept by experience. That means they not they are quite contradict with the last two points. So actually, most of them their experience comes from their practice. Now, uh, uh, even they, uh, 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 when they working after uh, the school, after they finish the school, and uh, 50, uh, 58 percent, almost sixty percent, will stay away from the patient more than eight meter, and twenty three percent when they uh, when they keep the, uh, doing the portable X ray, they will stay away from the patient fifty meters, even outside the what area. So you see, it's very far away. They cannot. Uh, so after that, you can see that sixty. 66% may not observe uh, the patient while making exposure. Actually, they cannot observe the patient so far away. And 60% are using automatic delay exposure device. What is an automatic delay exposure device? This is some kinds of, uh, uh, like the exposure switch, but if you press it, you, you the, the, the exposure will not come out immediately, but it will come out after five to 10 seconds. This is like the second point. The last one I say, 81% use this. Uh, delay time uh, more than five seconds and it's 40 percent were more than 10 seconds so this is very interesting when they press the button they have five seconds to 10 seconds to run away from the patient so it can be run far far away you can imagine why they have this kind of uh, impression or this kind of uh, uh, behavior because of the regulation system uh, first of all, I can say that uh, a lot of safety policy is not really well uh, evident based, especially the people executing that kind of policy. Radiation leave uh, in China, they have for the radiation worker. But from the other point of view, if 
the radiation worker really have the radiation hazard. Uh, this kind of leaf, is it really helpful? I don't know. Why not try to minimize the dose of the uh, their working environment? This is the rule of the problem. And uh, another point is that if uh, the, the staff have the TLT reading come back, if the dose is high, quite high, they will say, oh, you have removed the staff from the radiation uh, working environment. This is very interesting. Why we not, from my experience, we should investigate what happened to the staff, why they have good high dose. We have to improve the, the, the environment better than doing that. And uh, the, the, uh, the another point is, um, Redufus seldom have chance to take charge of the radiation protection, uh, especially most of the regulation and guidelines do not have show up. The Redufus have the have the role to do the radiation protection. In especially some inspection happen in the department, some of the inspector actually are not come from the radiation professionals. Uh, they are not. Some of them may be come from nursing. Or some of them may come from the clinical doctor. The most, even the most interesting, they will come. Uh, is it really as a radiation uh, expert? I can say, but actually, his working place is not in the hospital. He's working in the nuclear plant. So this kind of people going to inspecting your environment. How come they can good, give the good comment to to our radiation protection? I don't, I don't understand. Okay, after this kind of uh, quite interesting feature happened, so what I can do or I try to do uh, to improve them. So first of all, uh, according to the internationally uh, experience, I bring it to my hospital. So uh, all the co-op radiation safety management should be formed by the radiologists, radiologists, and uh, radiation physicists or medical physicists. So uh, in my, I think my hospital is the first of the hospital uh, in in the in this region. Uh, we have the so-called the physicists post. Um, we in our department, yeah, we have a uh, local physicist, and uh, we in the hospital we have uh, Hong Kong uh, registered uh, medical physicists come in to help them to manage most of the radiation safety issue. On the other hand, we also enhance the radiation protection training for the our staff, uh, especially just. Uh, newly recruit staff, sometimes we will be using this kind of uh, training, uh, radiation protection training uh, material to teach the public also, uh, not just inside the hospital. On the other hand, uh, we give the good knowledge, we also have to uh, change the behavior and attitude. Okay, so the radiation protection is not just like a knowledge, but we have to uh, give them uh, so uh, the evidence-based practice. That means we have give them the reason and why we have they have to do this and how they can do this. So uh, especially just like me, uh, we sometimes we're going to work in the clinical, uh, in, in the clinical area. I will show them what's the good, or uh, the proper radiation protection behavior to handling the patient and the public. And uh, I also will conduct more public lecture, ask the, our staff, even myself, to share the, the, the radiation protection knowledge. And uh, why I'm so and and so interesting to do the, do the more uh, public lecture on the knowledge, uh, just like I have uh, experience and uh, from the. Japan Association of Radio, uh, Radiological Technologies, uh, they have doing quite um, impressive uh, uh, work for the uh, Fukushima nuclear accident. After uh, the accident happened, they helped the public to uh, to deal with the radiation safety after the incident. So very impressing me to do more public work for our public. Okay, and uh, the final thing that we have to do is uh, about the regulation system. So uh, actually, about after I review most of the regulation in China, uh, actually they are quite up to date, I can say, uh, on the paper. So most of the regulation quite according to the WHO, IAEA, even the AAMP, uh, so the, all the international society, uh, the, the recommendation. So now they you usually check back to the uh, GB 130 and uh, 2020 and uh, another GB uh, in uh, 20, 
10, those are the, the content are quite close to the international one. But the most important thing is, is who going to execute this kind of policy. And the radiation protection and safety management should be one of the CP subject in our profession, such as some country in East Asia. Yes, yeah, very impressive me, just like in Taiwan, Japan, they have uh, Redolfus holding this kind of radiation protection officer role uh, of, the, of the department or even in the hospital. It's very important for the, the proper management uh, of the radiation safety in everyday work. And the radiation safety of the radio department and hospital should be managed by the uh, radiation protection professional, uh, such as radiologists, uh, microphysicists, and the radiologists. And finally, the radiologists, because they every day they have to facing the patient, so they have the important role of the radiation protection and the safety, uh, especially the, when the hospital doing accreditation or assessment uh, uh, by the government at the same time. So um, we are uh, we are emphasized doing this to do the good job for the, uh, for my hospital doing the accreditation. Uh, our radiologists have played an important role to help the accreditation. Uh, doing the, especially uh, the inspecting the radiation safety. Okay, summary. Radiologists are using radiation to help the diagnostic patient every day. That's true. We have a close contact. We face patient every day. We have to see them every day. So we have a good chance to help the uh, our patient to to to, uh, to to protect them. And. Uh, we are the important guidance of the radiation safety to the public, to the population. Yes, just as I said before, we have the greatest population in the community. We have more chance to give this kind of a, a positive or also called correct information to the public about what is the uh, good radiation protection in the medical setting. Our attitude and knowledge of the RP is a very yeah, it's our professional competency. Yeah, that's why right. if you so scary to the radiation, do not have positive to the radiation, why you can work in the uh, radiology department is very interesting. So we should practice uh, radiation protection and safety policy making and the monitoring. Yes, um, this is very important to bring our voice to the policy makers say, uh, let them to understand uh, those radiation safety policy can affect our work and sometimes is not quite correct or not quite realistic when we're helping our patient. So we should participate of the policy making and doing the monitoring system uh, of the monitoring system. Okay, this is my reference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ho and Professor uh, uh, inviting me to participate in this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Edward, uh, for this very nice talk. I can see that the summary of that is empowerment, isn't it? Empowerment of the radiographers and radiologic technologies uh, to be guardians of radiation safety in the hospital. And I also like the word used to shoulder the wrist. Uh, it's so important. I see a number of questions have been coming in. Keep uh, writing. We will have a discussion after the second speaker. Okay. Uh, now let me introduce the second speaker, Professor K. Yamada. Yeah, uh, Professor Yamada is the Professor and Chair of Radiology, Department of Radiology, Kyoto Prefectural University of Medicine uh, in Kyoto, Japan. And is well qualified as MD, PhD, which is uh, excellent. Uh, is published a lot and have won many international awards. And particularly, uh, Professor Yamada has been involved with uh, several international professional bodies. Uh, and also been editors in many journals. Some of these, for example, are in the Neural Radiology Journal, Korean Journal of Radiology, Japanese Journal of Radiology, MAGMA, IMR, I, and so on. Uh, and Professor Amada has a lot of experience uh, in teaching research and also in management. And he will speak to us on this topic, 
impending shortage of human resources in radiology and the impact on radiation safety. Over to you, Professor Yamada. Okay, thank you very much. There will be a video uh, recorded, so let's uh, roll the film. Hello, everybody. This is Kei Yamada speaking from Japan, and today I'll be talking about the uh, shortage of human resource uh, found in the radiology uh, business and its impact on safety. So I'll start with the introduction and talk about the strategies uh, against the shortage, and a little bit about AI and sum up. So this is my first introduction showing the the, the uh, value of medicine. It's quite simple. A value equals quality over cost, or you can rephrase it and say it's outcome over cost or maybe safety over cost. So this general rule will uh, appear over and over uh, during my talk. So that's why I just listed it right here at the beginning of my presentation. So I would like to start with uh, this Lancet article showing the distribution of the resource uh, in radiology business. So this is uh, the distribution of CT, how much you have in your country. Uh, this is PET, this is mammography, this is MRI and SPECT and radiologists. So I'll go back five slides from here and show you the CT scan once again. And I can tell you the general rules. Uh, the neighboring countries tend to have a similar trend. So in Europe, they're green. Uh, in Australia and New Zealand, they ha also have a similar trend. And also, if you look at Thailand, India, and the Philippines, they all have a similar trend as well. So maybe I will flip through the uh, items and show you that particular trend. So PET mammography, MRI, SPECT, and radiologists. And we live here in Asia. And if you look at the number of the radiologists, uh, it's not too high. It's not too low, but it's not too high. If you compare it to the European continent or maybe to the United States and Canada, we lack human resource. Uh, it's relative to the other developed countries. Now, even in the developed countries, there is a shortage. They say they have shortage. They say that it's a global issue. And this is a news uh, that came out from the United States stating that the uh, increasing number of the studies is 5% per year, whereas your residency programs are providing 2% per year uh, surplus to the field. And again, we're talking about the countries where they have substantial amount of radiologists. Uh, another article from RSNA, and they state that it's due to the aging population. It's because of the Medicare benef beneficiaries. And they also point out that it's the uneven distribution. And uneven distribution is uh, also ubiquitous uh, wherever you go, even in Japan or Europe. And you can see that in France, you have a lot of people in Paris, but the surrounding areas, there's uh, lack, lacking, uh, they're lacking uh, personnel. So how do we tackle this problem? There are a few ways that I can think of, and I list it up here, and I'm gonna go through each item step by step. But number one will be the recruitment. We have to attract the best and the brightest, and we also have to uh, advocate from the medical school and attract the digital natives because they will probably do very well in AI. Now, what about outsourcing? Outsourcing uh, started in USA. You remember the company called Nighthawk and they put up stations in English, English speaking countries. Uh, and they are placed in uh, these regions of the the globe and it will cover the 24 hour uh, of the United States uh, and they will have reports right away. 
So this is uh, done through the internet, of course, and uh, it extended to the rest of the world. For example, uh, it, uh, it extended to UK. And I'm showing you one example from Oxford sh showing that out of our CT scans, uh, when it's outsourced, uh, then the job satisfaction will go up substantially. And of course, the trade-off will be money. So they have to have someone to pay for it. And of course, it's the hospital uh, who's going to pay for it. And financially speaking, it's uh, not a com perfect um, scheme. And here's a report from RCR, uh, and it's quite interesting to see that they also have substantial shortage of radiologists. And th this is how they actually uh, uh, cope with the shortfalls in reporting capacity. Uh, and they're showing the general trend from 2015 to 2020. And uh, they've uh, noticed that uh, insourcing and outsourcing is increasing in institutions. So right currently, 90% of the institutions are using either insourcing or both out insourcing and outsourcing. Insourcing meaning they let the workers work extra hours. Outsourcing, of course, is to use the internet to send out the cases to different institutions, or uh, usually it's a private company. Another way to tackle the problem could be the physician extenders. And this sort of uh, relates with the technologist who's actually watching this show. And as you may know, this physician extenders uh, started in the United States and it covers all these uh, different fields. And also there are also anesthesiologists and some other fields that are uh, very specific uh started in 1960s when it started it started off with the primary care physicians assistants but now they work in uh, general hospitals and they have specific fields that they work in and uh it's uh indispensable currently in the system of the united states uh, and if you look at the recent trends in radiology, it appears that more and more departments of radiology, they are hiring physician extenders. And if you look at the article from 2022, JACR, you can see that there's sharp increase uh, in the past couple of years. And this is a graph from that particular paper showing a uh, steadily increasing number or percentage of work that they do compared to the entire RVU. The main thing that they work on is the invasive procedure. This is a uh, biopsy uh, or uh, some thracosynthesis, uh, drainage of abscesses, those kind of stuff. And it's the work of them uh, to, uh, to, to do these jobs and it's steadily increasing. Clinical evaluation and management is also a key component. But I would like to draw your attention to this non-invasive imaging, which means regular MRI, regular CT scans. And it appears that it's not substantial number, but still steadily increasing. This is a different story when it comes to UK because they have substantial shortage of radiologists. So what happens is that they let the radiographers read and you can see that this trend is going up in the recent years. And vice versa, what, what, what is interesting is that the delegation to the clinicians is decreasing substantially. So this is a good trend. I have the same strategy in Japan where we uh, let the radiologists read, let the, the technologists read some of the cases so that we don't have to delegate to the clinicians because the delegation to the clinician is sometimes problematic. You know, they could work on their own business and just sort of take it off from the radiologists. Uh, radiographers or technologists would not do it. They will work together with us. They are more friendly. They are more, how do you say, they are in our loop to begin with. And therefore, it's better to have it insourced to your own uh, colleague in the hospital.
Now, recurrent education is another way to tackle the problem. Uh, in Japan, at least, uh, we cannot let anyone retire unless they, of course, they insist. But our retirement age is uh, 65, and we're aiming for an ageless society, and therefore, we don't want to let anyone go. Of course, uh, this is only if they want, but if you look at the age of 65, it looks like still 75% of the people are working, but it will substantially drop over time. And therefore, we want to elevate the curve to somewhere around here so that we'll have uh, some radiologists uh, around us. Uh, and actually, that's what's happening currently. And I have not seen any uh, radiologists over 65 to retire completely. They work. Uh, maybe part-time, but they don't completely retire. This is a rock singer, 75-year-old, uh, or 74, I forgot. He's still singing, and why not radiologists? Okay, so I try to hire people back and make it part-time, sometimes make it uh, feasible to work from home. And this leads to the next topic, which is the digital transformation. So hybrid work probably has uh, started in each one of your country. Uh, it's something new after COVID-19 and reading from home, at least in my institution, it has become routine. So there are a few people who's reading from home, not all the time, but once a week or so, which will ease in their life a little bit. It will make uh, things more flexible. So people like it. And it also says in this particular report that when you advertise open position with hybrid work, then you get more applicants. So it's a good thing. Now, what about AI? Is it going to help? And at least I think it's going to help, at least in Japan, because we are lacking people. 50% of that work is being uh, delegated to the clinicians. That's a very bad condition. It's even worse than the UK and therefore AI will be our savior. And implementation could be easier in that kind of situation, and also it will probably work for the safety uh, issues as well. This is a review article uh, showing that there are a few different uh, aspects of AI that can be utilized uh, to make the medicine more safety. For example, diagnostic, diagnostic procedures or venous thromboembolism detection through not only through the computer vision, but also from the lab data and everything else. Uh, but AI could help in these aspects and radiology is uh, uh, remotely related to these uh, issues. And as you know, a lot of AI is coming out. FDA is approving more and more AI and Actually, most of them are radiology or cardiovascular related, and therefore we're in the center of the entire business. So we have to know we uh, what's going on. We have to learn what's happening. And if you look at the trend in the United States, uh, it appears that it, it it gets implemented more to larger practices, maybe because they have more money, maybe because they are much more busier. We don't know it uh, exact what exactly is happening, but that's uh, the general trend. So, will the AI gain citizenship? It depends on whether it gets reimbursed. But reimbursement is not that common, and it's under hot discussion. And reimbursement versus uh, uh, approval is uh, completely different. So we have to bear that in mind. It's not the same. We have a lot of uh, softwares uh, that gets approved, but only a few of them uh, get reimbursed. And in order to sort of make up the idea about what's going on around the world, we have to have the stakeholders uh, listed up. So I'll list up six stakeholders that's related to the AI business, which is patients, number one, physicians, developers, investors, regulatory agencies, and payers. Payers meaning insurance companies or the government in Japan. And once again, the general rule is that you have to increase the value of medicine. And in order to do that, you have to increase the quality or safety, or you have to decrease the cost, or you can increase the outcome. 
So does the tool really improve the safety or quality or the outcome? Well, at least we've seen the review articles saying that it could potentially increase the value uh, of the medicine. But what about the quality? Well, the current, uh, current concept of AI sort of states that it's not going to exceed the teachers and therefore it's not going to ex- exceed the experts. So increasing the quality could be a little difficult. And outcome, maybe yes, in terms of outcome, because if you can shorten the time period that the patient appears in the OR or ER, uh, then you can uh, uh, increase the probability of good outcome. And this happened to the stroke AI, and I'm going to talk about it a little later. Uh, and the, the reason why it's being approved is because of the uh, shorter time needed to reach the neurologist. Now, does the AI diminish the cost? Well, maybe yes, if you are able to skip some of the personnel, and that includes radiologists sometimes. Let's say, for example, in the stroke uh, AI, the Viz AI that I'm going to talk about later on, it's going to shortcut some people like us, and then it could reduce cost. We don't like it, but we cannot help. So if you look at the reimbursement status around the world, it's not yet uh, done in the Europe, uh, but yes, in USA, and also a little bit in Japan. So I'll talk about these uh, in the next few slides. So in USA, there are different schemes. Uh, the most common could be the CPT code, but it's kind of rare for the AI business. Uh, there are a few other ways, and mostly used is the NTAP, and it only lasts for three years. And a typical example could be the heart flow. This is really not AI, but it's been implemented uh, a few years back. It started off with a very expensive uh, cost, but it dropped substantially. So like I said, it only lasts for three years. And uh, majority of the AI in the United States is paid through this NTAP. So this is a list showing the eight different AI systems. Most of them are actually related to radiology, uh, but you can see that only one has been approved for CPT. The rest is all NTAP. And uh, I'm showing up, uh, highlighting here the stroke-related one. This is a VIZI for large vessel occlusion. This is a VIZI for subdurals. And also, uh, some AI is meant to uh, guide you through the ultrasound examinations and some other, uh, another AI uh, helping you to detect the thromboembolism. So these are the ones, the only ones that's been reimbursed. What about Japan? It started last year. It's paid through the ARMI. Uh, and it only will uh, give you five US dollars per month per patient. And it's only 2,000 or 200,000 US dollars per hospital, depending on your, the size. So this is for the university hospitals. This is bar- barely enough to get one or two very cheap softwares. Uh, but the concept of this ARMI is that it's not meant to pay for the software itself. It's meant to uh, manage the proper use of AI. It's a fee for the management. So this is an indirect cost. And therefore, it may not be evidence-based. Um, it's kind of unclear how we should be using the money. And this is one big problem. Um, the government message, government's message is clear. You know, they want to promote the AI, but is it a, a direct promotion? Maybe not. It's very indirect. And do we think it sustains the research on AI? Well, maybe not because it's so unclear for what this money is we have to be using for. And like I said, it's barely enough to get one or two very cheap AI. So it will, it will be, it will be pushing the companies a little bit, but, uh, not to, uh, not well enough to, to make it a lucrative, um, business.
and I found a paper recently about the the these uh, processes. And in this paper, it's actually a paper out from the governmental institution. And this is the title of the paper, or the white paper, I should say. Uh, in the, this white paper, it says that decision-making processes that are transparent and evidence-based are more likely to foster innovation. And I think this is very true. So therefore, all these uh, reimbursement processes should be a little more clear and more transparent, evidence-based. Uh, that will create a better world. So to sum up, uh, I talked about the global shortage of the human resource. Uh, there are a few uh, ways to intervene. And uh, number one is to recruit good people. Number two is outsourcing and insourcing physician extender. This is related to the technologist who's watching uh, recurrent education, digital transformation, reading from home, and also AI could help. And value we provide is dependent on safety. And like I pointed out, AI could be increasing the safety a little bit. Uh, we don't know yet. There's not yet any evidence, but we should be probably working on it uh, hard. Um, and also AI could be reimbursed, but it has to be more transparent so that uh, uh, it can be uh, fostering uh, next generation in innovation. So that's about it. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, and I will love to see you guys uh, somewhere in real life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yamada, for your very interesting and uh, realistic look at the impending shortage of radiologists uh, in, in Japan and worldwide as well. Uh, we see that it would definitely impact the safety as well as quality. Right, uh, we have a couple of questions uh, coming in. Uh, should we invite uh, Edward uh, and uh, Kay uh, to be ready for some of these questions from our participants? Uh, and Dr. Ho will join us as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, two questions are related from Abdallah Abu Sayyab. What is the TLD dress policy about where it should be put inside or outside the shoe? I uh, probably mean the uh, protective garment. Uh, and then the number second question, those reference level for intervention radiology, uh, mm, operation, auto and urology question mark. Okay, why not you tackle the first question first, Edward? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can hear me, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, most of the time, I will recommend my colleagues, including the cardiologists, uh, of course, radiologists who know how to do it, uh, cardiologists uh, in, 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 and other interventionalists. So they should put the first TLD inside their uh, protective garment, just say in the chest or in the mm -hmm. west. And the mm -hmm. second one, they can sometimes, in, depends on local quality, some of them you put the second TLD uh, at the collar, at the leg collar, because they want to compare the radiation dose and to see the radiation dose, radiation, uh, the compare the radiation dose during the intervention. So for the normal normal package, we should put uh, the TLD uh, inside the protective gun. Just a my recommendation to my colleagues. Yeah. Thank you for that. In fact, this question has been raised repeatedly uh, in different uh, webinars. Somehow, uh, I wish there's be a clear cut uh, recommendation on that. Now, how about the second one? I think he was referring to the DRL. Uh, yes. For intervention radiology. Uh, I'm, I'm also managed uh, the DSA uh, section. So um, the DRL, I have the those uh, management system. And also, I have keep uh, recording the, all the intervention. You know, see, uh, how about the radiation dose of them? And uh, but this is a very um, so-called undefined area for the DRL because in the DSA we have different kinds of procedure, and uh, and the, and even the control personnel sometimes change the personnel time to time. 
So it's not quite easy to get a very good dose reference. But in my department, from my experience, I can say, uh, for example, I will uh, keep track recording my cardiologist, how they perform their PCI or something like that for a long time. Uh, at the beginning, maybe the machine too little from them or they're not quite familiar. So the dose is quite a bit uh, higher, but not over the so-called recommendation from the other countries, just like UK. But uh, on the, uh, after around two years, they have a good better practice and also have a familiar machine. They are so-called, uh, I can say that those uh, the record in the, my department of our, uh, the, the cardiologists are going to down and also uh, up close at the pectoral. So, uh, so um, for example, I can say that uh, the dose they are going to do for average for the application will be around the half or one or two third of the dose reference from some country, just like UK. That way. Okay, thank That's you. That's what much. I can yeah. do. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's go to the, the next question is, uh, Dr. Yvonne Ho asked, how does AI or even working from home impact safety in radiology, especially radiation safety? How will radiologists work with radiographers if no radiologists are on site to actually see the work situation? Mm -hmm. How about those script lack of collimation until post-processing cropping? Mm. Okay, Professor Yamada, we like to attempt to answer this question. Well, uh, working from home is not related to safety at all. It's, uh, you probably remember the title of my uh, talk uh, is about uh, lack of personnel. And working from home is related to that, but not the safety. So that's question number one. What was the other one? Oh, how uh, does AI help? I explained in the slides that there is a review article pointing out that it could help, potentially help, in detecting thromboembolism or some other diagnostic errors. But this is very futuristic view, and I'm not sure if this is going to be applicable right away. The review article points out that there is a possibility, but I don't, but I don't have anything in my hands that really helps in terms of safety. So this is more about the future, not now. Did I answer mm. your question? Actually, not quite, because I was interested in finding out if we work from home, we actually may make it less safe because we are not there to, to, to immediately uh, look into the issues of safety. So maybe Edward may have some ideas on, on this because you're on, on, on the floor, you know, you're on the ground. Yes. Yeah, um, and actually I have did um, the AI topic just uh, after uh, the ECL. My paper is talking about AI. They talk about the efficiency of the AI. So that kind of AI is uh, talking about making the report. So uh, from my experience, um, some is uh, improving the, just like uh, Dr. Yamada said, they improve the efficiency for the radiologist, for the radiologist to do the reporting. But not all. For example, I have four modules. One of the modules is also delayed the turn, report turn around time. It's very interesting. And on the other hand, the AI standard, and in for the safety of the radiology, this is another kind of AI, it's imaging AI. That means they improving the image quality, especially um, some of the, nowadays some of the vendor, uh, even uh, some artifact, they can uh, 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 erase it or even the, they reduce the artifact. So for example, the um, movement artifact or breathing artifact, from CT or MRI, something like that. So this kind of uh, AI can help uh, the patient safety, especially repeating the exam, something like that. And uh, sometimes, for example, another AI I saw in the ESL is, uh, for example, doing the contrast CT. The contrast injection time may be not quite good, but after the AI tuning the contrast, they can give the similar, uh, the proper contrast exam for the resources to do these kinds of AI, I think, is very uh, good to help the patient safety. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Yeah, uh, it's exciting areas. I'm sure we hear more about that later. Uh, one more question from uh, Ishika Singhao: Why there are those limits for the patient when radiologists or radiotechnologists operate? Hmm. 
the patient for such imaging modalities. Uh, but probably I, I want to attempt to answer that. If you mind, uh, well, I work with uh, yeah. radiation protection. I consult for the IEA on this. Uh, first, there is no dose limit for patients. Those limits are for radiation workers, right? Uh, so that there isn't uh, for patients. Well, when the radiologist will testify, right? We need that, and so be it. Okay? So uh, we only can use the uh, the clinical judgment of radiologists to order or request a radiograph or examination to be done. Okay. So uh, there is no dose limit that, oh, you can't exceed certain point, right? Because if there's justified, then you do that. Okay. Uh, any more question coming in? Is it? Uh, yeah, uh, if, if uh, Edward could answer the question on the okay. collimation, because okay. uh, with digital, uh, what we are doing is that we are not co collimating as tightly as we used to, and then we do post-processing cropping, and it's very difficult, <laughs> it's, it's, a very, it's something that is available and very difficult not to want yeah. to do. To avoid yeah. repeating. So in the purpose of avoiding repeating, which actually exposes the radiation patient to more radiation. Yeah. Now, what, what do you suggest is the best way not to do that? You know, because in the yeah. end, you're still exposing the patient when you take the yes. whole head just to do the sinuses. Yeah. Yes. So um, uh, just according to my experience, um, I can tell my colleagues all the way to chopping every day, every time. Um, sometimes, well, we have uh, uh, we have the policy before, so we uh, stop all the uh, so-called digital chopping of the machine. But however, it's not quite good for the radiologist because you have no very place uh, in the background, so it is not good for them to do the reporting when they see in the back system. So uh, after I have the dose management system, so I have uh, one of the tools to monitoring uh, their performance by observing the exposure index. Uh, I have to do the same paper in the last uh, ISRT World Congress. So talking about how to use the AI to monitoring the performance. If the, um, what to see that they doing the really bad chopping is if you want uh, going to check the AI uh, and also the exposure factor. If the exposure factor seems to be normal in the suitable range, but however, the AI is too high. So the conclusion is like that. Uh, I'm going to many trends also waiting like this. Um, one of the factors affecting the EI, but with the proper uh, exposure factor, is the collimation. So, if the EI is so high, but the exposure factor is good enough, so I can say that this uh, uh, this exam, uh, the relevant did not do a good job because of the collimation. So, afterward, we can go back to check from the machine or from the tech system is it really do the electronic chopping is too seriously? So, we can comment about. Uh, this is relevant. You should do better next time. Okay, that's all. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Edward. Uh, it's time that for us to uh, wrap up the, of the webinar and uh, discussion. I would like to invite the two speakers uh, to say something that's our last words. Remember, our theme is radiologists and radiographers collaborating to promote radiation safety. Right? We'd like to invite uh, Edward and then Professor Madal after that uh, to say uh, a few words how we can uh, proceed to collaborate more, uh, more meaningful and what action can we take. Uh, could you start with you, Edward? For me? <laughs> okay. Uh, um, from the rate of us, uh, just I was not going to say before, uh, we have always uh, deep contact with the patients. So I, when we uh, have a very uh, important role to explain the radiation safety and why we do that, uh, why we do not do that. Just like a very hot topic recently in Europe, talking about the phone shooting, the contact shooting, uh, should we do or not? So sometimes uh, in the, from the new uh, recommendation from AAMPR, uh, they have a document say, oh, we should not go into the phone shooting anymore. It's no good for them. But if, for my example, some patient you still believe uh, some shielding, uh, contact shielding seem to be still more comfortable psychologically. Okay, 
I will say to my colleagues that if you if you actually you have the techniques to do it properly, that's okay. But on the other hand, if sometimes we cannot do it, so we need our medical physicists, uh, radiologists to give more uh, evidence and give more uh, support for our radiologists to uh, explain to the patient or some incident happened. This is what my position I feel we need to cooperate uh, together to uh, work with our patient, uh, especially some new evidence, new policy coming up. That's my okay, point. Okay, thank you. Uh, but yeah, how about you, uh, Kei Yamada Sensei, please? Uh, yes, uh, it, this is something that I write, already mentioned, but in order to keep the place safe, uh, we are seriously lacking people. It's not only radiologists, but it's the middle man that I'm talking about. I presented about the physician extenders. These are the nurse practitioners or radiologist assistants. And we seriously need those personnel to help us because, you know, there are diverse uh, level of skills for the technologists. Some of them are super, but some of them are push buttons. And if we let the push, those people who cannot manage radiation go alone in the field, we're harming the patients. And therefore, we need some, somebody in between, you know, the, the higher education. So that's why I pointed out physician extenders, that is the nurse practitioners, has to be implemented in our medical system as well. And in our country, in my country, Japan, they already started it, but not quite mature enough. And I'm not sure if it happened already in Korea or somewhere else, but we're following the American model. So that's my final uh, conclusion. We need those personnel. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kay. And now over to Dr. Yun Ho, uh, and also she'll uh, conclude this uh, afternoon's webinar. So, yes, I would like to thank Edward and uh, Kay for giving off their time. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, Edward is at the airport. Uh, he's uh, still in Vienna after attending to the ECR. We thank you also to all the participants. I know there are a lot of uh, radiographers in our uh, Delhi, uh, the whole audience. So please uh, don't forget to do the feedback form. There was a question about whether you get a certificate of attendance, you will get it. For some countries, we can submit it for our CBD provider, but for some other countries, it is not possible. But at least you can show this to your hospital and uh, to show that you are attending CBD and CME programs. This both for radiologists and uh, radiographers. So if uh, Sarita, oh, and don't forget, 31st of March is the second installment of this Asia Safe ISSRT um, webinar. And there you will have two speakers, the president of ISSRT, Napapang Pong Napang, and also the president of the Royal Australasian and New Zealand College of Radiology speaking on aspects of safety when they collaborate. Um, so in addition, you will be able to see uh, Professor Noriyuki Tomiyama, our new AOSR president. He will be there to give the welcome speech. Uh, so please mark your calendar for one hour on uh, 31st of March. I know it will be the fasting month for some of our Muslim colleagues, but we hope to finish and wrap it up in time for you to book up wasa, which is breakfast. Uh, we had actually 184 registrations for this meeting, which is very encouraging. That was a week ago. We hope that all of you will... Don't forget, you can also view it if you came in late or forgot about it. Tell your friends they can view it as long as they have registered on the webinar platform uh, for two weeks after this event. So I hope that QR code, you are recording it or doing some scanning it so that you can get to the feedback form to get your certificate of attendance. Uh, with that, I wanted to thank everyone again uh, for participating and uh, for the speakers to just stay on for a couple of minutes for us to have a post uh, session uh, debrief. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend, all of you. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay, On ahead. behalf of organizers, I thank everyone for being a part of this session. This is Sarita and Samyukta signing off, wishing you all a good day. <laughs>